Power Corporation of Canada generates cash these days rather than electricity. The story actually dates back to 1925, and each generation brings to the table yet another set of creative business genius. Well, the latest generation is here with me today. Paul Demeray Jr. is the chairman, and with his brother Andre, he's the co-CEO of Power Corporation of Canada. Welcome to NCAD Knowledge. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Your holdings today, it's an interesting story. They're, they're a center basically on financial services, some publishing assets. How did this shift from, uh, to finance happen from, uh, actually, from, from buses? It started uh, with electricity, and the government nationalized the company, and the company fell into a lot of cash. And at that time, the executives invested in a number of companies. And of course, they fell into this huge pool of money, and they invested. They must have had close to 50 companies. And there were a whole myriad of them. And my father came on the scene about at that time when they got into trouble, because they'd bought these 50 companies, got into trouble. My father came on the scene, and he did what they called a reverse takeover. It was one of the, probably the first in Canada, where he built a small bus line that he had inherited, in a sense, from his mother, all five buses. And uh, he built that into a bigger bus line and built it sort of into the Greyhound buses of Canada, if you want, and then uh, sold that to this company, got a number of shares, became the CEO, and then uh, himself sort of changed the company pretty dramatically, probably brought it down to about 15 companies, let's call it, uh, 15 to 20 companies, and had a series of, of areas uh, of which transportation, of course, was the, 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 the beginning, so we'd kept that. But we had also some uh, mineral company, pulp and paper companies. Uh, and, um, and my father ventured also at that time into an insurance company and to a mutual fund company. And those were actually the foundation of our company today, as it, as it turns out. And so as my father evolved in, in his career, he uh, pruned that down to a smaller number of companies, let's call it 10 or so, but with still a pretty big array of, of, of companies, all of which today uh, the foundations are still in the group, whether it be the media uh, or the financial services. But we decide to shed the other sectors because um, the we, buses, including the buses, yeah, including the buses, which was a, I still remember the day that we did that. It was quite an emotional event, and the the idea was, I guess, um, when my brother and I took over and said, well, you know, w what can we do with these different assets, and where can we be, let's call it champions or be number one? I'm sort of, you know, we all have our little ideas of how do we should, you know, run companies, and and our thought, my brother and I was we should try and focus on being number one in one or two sectors. And as a family business, knowing that capital is limited at some point for a family, you can't be issuing shares all the time because you get diluted, um, well, we decided to, to pick financial services, which we had already a good start on. And we were very fortunate because in the last 15 years, we were able to consolidate the insurance industry in our country and went from being number six in our country to number one in our country by buying two of our competitors. Uh, sort of in intervals of about three to five years, we absorbed these different companies. And then we did the same in the mutual fund business. We had a big competitor. We were already in the top, probably the first or second in the country. Uh, the banks were starting to get in the mutual fund business. We were able to buy a big competitor, and it vaulted us up into a strong leading position. And then we continued in that with that strategy even in the last few years. In 2006, 2007, we bought Putnam, which is a big mutual fund company in the U.S. Let me just ask you what kind of criteria you used or your father used initially to decide which to keep, which to consolidate, which to, which to buy, which to jettison, because it was a, rather an interesting, delicate story. I'd say our approaches were, were not quite the same in the sense that my father is a, a true entrepreneur. I mean, started business, built his, his business. My father had, I'd say, an unusual acumen for a financial uh, ability to be able to see opportunities, and then a, a great ability to negotiate, meet people, and get things done. So he's very opportunistic in his, in, his, in his approach, and therefore was able to shed things, depending on things, how things were going on. We, my brother and I, uh, took a more, you might call it more formalized approach. Uh, you could call it an INSEAD mm. approach, if you'd like. I, I wondered. Uh, a business <laughs> approach, yeah, it was. It was somewhat more in that sense. I'd done a lot of my training in strategic planning with, uh, with, uh, st with Standard Brands and Nabisco, who had a fantastic strategic department that they'd hired in from GE, who were the sort of 
gurus in the area. So I learned a lot both from INSAD and then from that area on the strategy side. And it's something that always appealed to me, appealed to my brother as well. So we started in the firm, started a culture of strategy and um, let's call it analytics of, uh, of uh, things like your competitors, where you're going to be, who you've got to buy, how you're going to try and get somewhere. And so we took, I'd say, a very um, measured and analytical approach to where we were going to go um, versus opportunistic. Now, my brother and I like to think that we still have some of my father's entrepreneurial blood, so we do remain opportunistic at times. And of course, you're going to take over big competitors. You've got to be somewhat opportunistic because you've got to go while the fire is hot. But, but that's the difference in the approach. I would imagine the jewel in your crown in financial services might be um, Great, Great West Life. It is. Uh, Great West Life was the first company, the one my father originally bought. And then we bought two great, great companies who were just about, were about the same size, Great West Life, a company called London Life that was a big company and very specialized in the individual side of the business. Great West Life had a great reputation on the group side of the business. And then we were fortunate that uh, later on we bought a company called Canada Life, and I don't think we'll improve on that brand name. <laughs> so that's the brand name we use in, in the UK where we have a big business as well. And uh, in the US, we use still the Great West Life and annuity brand. How did they do in the financial crisis? Uh, I mean, in insurance models and annuities and that sort of thing kind of were leveraged. You were more conservative. We, we were, I think we were fortunate in two respects. We had a very strong culture um, and my, my former CEO of Power Financial that worked for me with 20 years was a really fantastic addition to the family group. He's our, a professional manager that ran uh, a lot of the Power Financial group with us. And uh, he brought in a culture of uh, basically keeping a low cost approach to your back office, focusing on product and sales and not getting in the trap of on the asset side of your balance sheet trying to get risky assets to increase your margin, which a lot of insurance people did, of course some banks did, but to increase your asset, increase your spread, and often it would cover up your inefficiencies in the back office in terms of your cost ability or your, or your, or your distinctive product or brand or whatever that you're selling to try and create a margin that makes sense for the client. So on the asset side, we were always conservative for 20 years of conservatism. As I said to my board, when we went through this crisis, I said, you know, we're looking like we're doing things right now, but it's not that we did them right now, it's that we did them right for 15 years and we didn't have all kinds of products that were coming due that would get us into trouble. Then on the liability side, which is another big issue, and you mentioned the annuity business, th that is, I think, what got a lot of companies into trouble. They got into a product well known in the U.S. called variable annuities with guarantees, they call it, and basically it guarantees you a set, uh, at a set rate of let's say 5% forever on your money and I mean you know life doesn't work that way and so the thought was in those days um, and still partly today <laughs> is that you could you know engineer basically through derivatives um, uh, basically um, protection and so we, we studied it carefully decided it was just too risky for us we couldn't quite understand I mean they have the what they call the three Greeks of the you know the alpha and the delta and the thing but now they got it up to five Greeks which is supposedly to say that you have no more risk or you're like one percentile risk well as it turns out when the black swan came in this particular issue um, you know the Greeks didn't work uh, these guys lost a lot of money became very problematic some companies were unhedged um, and so right now ironically um, we are now launching that product on new terms that we feel comfortable with. We've watched a lot of the errors have been made in the market and we've created a much more basic product. Because I think that's another thing that happened in the financial downspin is that people were chasing themselves and chasing clients and, and, and going crazy basically giving really conditions to clients that they shouldn't have been giving. You know, the financial crisis also made people look at the bank assurance model in Europe and in the U.S., whether or not Glass-Steagall should have been uh, repealed. I mean, it started with Citibank and Travelers, right. which was basically an illegal trans right. transaction. How do you feel about that? Should these comminglings go on? Well, I tell you, we came under a lot of pressure in Canada um, because a lot of people thought, or our competitors, and some of the banks thought they should buy the, the insurance companies. We've always kind of stood against it. 
And I think the reason, the fundamental reason, and we owned a bank at one time, and I think it's probably one of the reasons we have a pretty good understanding of how banking works. And we sold that, that bank. It was called a trust, but it was really banking type function. And the insurance business, and basically to keep it in its simplest form, um, I think the cultures are fundamentally very different. And the, and the fundamental reason for it is that one is a culture of long asset and long liabilities, and one is a culture of matching and mark-to-market, shorter-term sort of game, which is the banking side. And so because those cultures are very different, invariably, whenever they've mixed, they tend not to do well. Now, when they talk about banque assurance and you're just, you know, you're selling basically a guaranteed product with a wrapper so that you get a tax benefit to it in Europe, that's not insurance for me. That's putting a little wrapper on a, on a savings product. Uh, but, but the fundamentals of two cultures are different would be the bottom line, and therefore I'm not a big fan of putting those two cultures together. One of your holdings I was reading recently, uh, well, a Canadian press you're putting money into, you and, and some of the other, uh, the other stakeholders. Canadian press is kind of the uh, mutual, if you, if you yes. will. Um, what else do you own in media? You, you used to own TV and radio. That got sold. We, yeah, we used to own TV and radio. What's well known here in Europe, we used to own 25% of Bertelsmann, which is a significant group. And we, before that, we owned RTL and M6, and we sold it to Bertelsmann. That's how we got 25% of Bertelsmann. And then decided to get out of that uh, position in Europe. And in, and in, and in America, frankly, um, we owned 50% of, of Southern News, which owned pretty well a newspaper right across the country. One of the first decisions my brother and I took when we became co-CEOs is to actually get out of that business. What year was that? Uh, that would have been 1996. Um, Good timing. So it was a great timing. We were really fortunate. And we're fortunate to have a number of really great um, um, uh, managers with us. And we got ourselves convinced that basically we'd been tracking the newspaper industry over 10 years. And, you know, it's frightening. It was like losing 2% a year. It's just like clockwork and it's still going that way. And it's a variety of reasons, you know, less people are reading, uh, the, the younger people aren't reading, um, people are going also to segmented news, and there's so there are a whole variety of reasons. But we, we could see that coming, and we said, let's get out of the news media on the English side because we're too vulnerable. But we, Quebec, we kept all the French news in Canada. And for those who don't know Canada, it has you know, 10 provinces, one of them is, is Quebec. And that province is a francophone province. And we have the main newspaper in every city in that province. And therefore, it gives us a mass that, that again, going back to my number one concept, the number one concept, if it's regional market share, that's fine. And it's, of course, not attackable, right? Because French, not Americans are going to come and attack it. And so we had a sort of an interesting position there. And what we did was we right away gravitated to the Internet. So we have the biggest Internet site after Google. Uh, we get the most hits after Google in Quebec, which is quite something for a newspaper. And so we've gotten into uh, a fabulous company called Workopolis, which in the U.S. equivalents Monster. But we have like uh, basically most of the market share in Canada on job search. And we have 50% of that company. That's on internet-driven business. That's going well. We've just started a real estate internet company where you visit houses through real estate versus a broker. Young, young people are using it uh, off to a good success. And so... We think that the newspaper probably will gravitate someday to some sort of iPad form with uh, a newsroom and, and sort, of the, um, the sort of the iPad format of some kind, which, which is a paper you may even give to your client for a year's uh, or two years uh, abonnement, you know. Well, that's the distribution. What's the business model? The business model is going to have to be that people are going to have to pay for that advertising. Uh, and you're going to have to have some kind of an advertising model or some kind of a payment model uh, through that, that system. So that is frankly what everybody's working on, and that's the nut everybody's trying to crack. So, and have the you model, cracked it yet, or you're not telling no, us? No, we're not cracked it yet, but we are working hard on it, like very hard. We have a number of teams on this, and maybe it'll be also something that's hybrid. Maybe you'll get a newspaper a certain number of days, and maybe the rest you'll have an iPad, and then you'll gravitate your client to the iPad over time. And your advertisers, that's the problem, is you've got to gravitate both. And so it's, it's going to be challenging, but I think if I were to predict, in 10 years, somebody will have cracked the nut.
So why put the money into Canadian press? I mean, that, that's probably your content, really. That's not a big issue for us, to be honest. That's a marginal issue because we, Canadian press is just to be solidary to the rest of the Canadian newspaper system. We have, um, uh, we've invested a lot in our paper. In fact, our paper in North America was the only paper last year that had growing circulation in all of North America, and we won a prize for it. And the reason for it is we did the opposite of what I think a lot of people did. Most people went downscale and went more, let's say, call it tabloid TV format. Uh, we went upscale. So what we did is we have more columnists. We have reporters all over the world, and we're paying for them. And so we have reporters on all the hot spots in the world. We send them there. They come back. We have permanent person in Paris, permanent New York, permanent in Los Angeles. And so what it does is it brings the news to Quebec. Uh, which is a pretty closed place, it's all francophone. So it suddenly brings all this news translated in a, in a francophone way for the Quebecers to absorb and enjoy. And that's really created a brand for us. And so that's kind of our strategy. And that's really worked well for us. China, Chinese business. You've sort of been in and out of the China International Trust and Investment Corporation. Where, where, where are you now? CIDIC is, of course, was, as you know, when Deng uh, started is what he called his experiment with capitalism. He founded Cidic, and um, and he he um, 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 it was a Mr. Rong that that founded it, who was a, a Chinese uh, man who'd stayed through was put in jail during the Cultural Revolution, but had a diaspora around the world and was seen by Deng as somebody who could understand finance. We, our family, um, uh, became uh, friends with this gentleman. And the first big foreign investment that they ever made, uh, CIDIC, abroad was with our family in Canada. And it was very difficult, if you can imagine, because they were terrorized in doing it, because oh, my God, if we lose money, the, the great experiment will fall, you know. But the good news is we made a lot of money investing in the pulp business, and we made a lot of money, they made a lot of money, and it enabled CIDIC to show that he could invest abroad do things and do them not only in China but abroad. Since then, we've had a long um, uh, tradition uh, going back to Bo Yibo, who is one of the people on the long march with Mao and Chao Lai. He's one of the three fathers or four fathers of China, they call him. And through Bo Yibo and this Mr. Rong, we became um, uh, very acquainted with the Chinese government over basically now 30 years. And it all started with my father leading the first delegation to China, first business delegation to China with Pierre Liot Trudeau. And Trudeau at the time was very enamored with China and, uh, and wanted to make a point that we were going to be the first to be in China as a country and recognize them. And we did that, and our family were, were part of that at the very beginning. So our family goes back to 30 years, and my brother today is is has been going to China for 30 years himself. When he was very young with my dad, I went on a few of the trips. But this is really an area where my brother's really excelled and, and is watching over the company. So today, we're the biggest shareholders of CIDIC Pacific, which is the Hong Kong arm of CIDIC. We've started um, uh, a, a sort of a small investment company, holding company, that invests in stocks over there. And we have a special share that we're allowed to buy, that we were given a license to buy, that only very few groups in the world have a license to be able to trade in. And so we trade in these shares, and that's created a bit of a hub for us there. And then we've invested in a number of smaller deals. But uh, we've been, we have a real commitment to China, and it, it's going to be, it's now gone to the second generation, I, my brother and I, and it's very much in the process of going to the third generation to my, my, uh, my brother's uh, kids are very well implanted there. One's living in Shanghai right now, in fact. Speaking of generations, I wanted to end by asking you about INSEAD. Um, your father didn't go to business school. Oh. He sent you to INSEAD, or you went on your own, or how did this, whose idea was this? I tell you, it was the oddest circumstance of life in INSEAD. It was a luck of uh, really, really great fortune in my life, uh, because I was, of course, I'd gone to McGill and was thinking more of the classic you know, um, uh, MBA in Europe, in, in uh, the U.S., I'm sorry. And, um, and I met the people from Paribas and uh, Sir Sigmund Warburg. And uh, I was assistant to my father when I graduated for a year. And I met Sir Sigmund. Sir Sigmund said, well, why don't you come to London and work for me, young man, you know? And, um, and I'll never forget because at the same time, the Paribas people, a gentleman called Pierre Haas, who was head of the whole Paribas International, was the first guy to ever do a Eurobond in, in, in Europe. He invented the Eurobond with the Warburg people. And uh, he said, well, why don't you come work for me? But he said, you know what you should do? 
you should go to INSEAD. He says, you're going to work for Sir Sigmund, come and work for us, and then go into INSEAD as well. And he says, instead of doing two-year MBA, do two, three years doing this, and you'll get a better deal than having an MBA in, uh, over there. And so it was, it was a very fortunate thing because I came to INSEAD um, and uh, worked at Paribas, uh, then came to INSEAD, loved it, and then immediately went and worked for Sir Sigmund Warburg uh, in London. And, uh, of course, this school has a great, uh, with David Scully has a great tradition with Warburg, which is, you know, the, 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 the wheel keeps going. I didn't know, of course, David Scully at the time. I was just a junior at Warburg, but loved it. And enough to send your own son. Enough to send my own son. I, I have four sons, and I try to convince all of them that they should come to INSEAD. And I was very fortunate because my eldest uh, went to Harvard undergrad, so he'd done the American thing. And so for him, it really worked well. He thought, well, I'm going to do the INSEAD thing. He wanted the international uh, sort of world outlook, and that's what really appealed to him and all the different nationalities and people here. And I think also living in Europe, and because I've been very involved in my life with Europe, and INSEAD, in a sense, is, is, is really enriched my life in that way. That it's opened my eyes to, to wanting to live in Europe. And, and I, you know, I spend about, for much of my life, my career, about a week a month in Europe. So I have an office here, I have an apartment here, and, uh, and my son himself will be working here in one of our group companies and be also a bit like my brother's sons in China, will be establishing the relations here in Europe for the family as well and, and, and sort of following up on my work over the last 20 years or 30 years here, actually. It's been 30 years. <laughs> Keep thinking. It goes by fast. The very last question I wanted to ask you is what do you think business schools like INSEAD ought to be teaching their students? Maybe something that's not a curriculum item like MBA, but some other value or insight? What I like about INSEAD is I think it's really seems to be in the forefront of that. I, I mean, I like the INSEAD spirit of, of saying, you know, it's going to first, it truly embraces the world. It's that world mentality. It's like the difference between an investor and an owner. There's a difference in, the, in that if you really embrace something you're, as an owner, uh, you care about it intensely. I think INSEAD is really helping people become more than international. They're helping them become worldly and have an embracing of, of world. And that includes not just the business world, but, but the social world and other things of that nature so that INSEAD graduates can be, people can really change, you know, change the dial, move the dial. And I think today as a businessman, if you're going to lead a large group, I think you have to have more than just the business side to it. You've got to have a sense of, of the world, you have a sense of history, a sense of culture, a sense of caring, and a variety of issues that you have to bring into the scope of, of what you're doing to, to rally everybody together. Thank you very much, Paul Demore okay. Jr., for being Thank with you. us. Thank you. Enjoyed it.